So earlier this year, Fire Force, the highly popular anime in manga, finished its run. Well, at least it finished its manga run. The anime is still in the works and is years behind the manga, so anime-only watchers, nothing to worry about there. But there's a beauty in a finished manga. It means any questions that we're ever going to have answered have already been answered. And any questions we may still have, well, unfortunately, we'll never get an answer to. And while it's aggravating that some of the questions we want answered will never be answered, it makes doing things like, I don't know, raking and explaining characters a whole lot easier. Because every single one of Shinra, Arthur, Maki, Tamaki's feats are laid out in front of me and some of those feats are terrifyingly powerful. By the end of the manga, there are two separate members of Squad 8 who could probably kill the majority of the characters from the big three. And there could possibly be a third one, except we never really see the full scale of their abilities. For those of you who are anime only for Fire Force, I'm gonna try and stay as spoiler free as possible for this video. But when talking about the true strength of every single member of Squad 8, it's kind of hard to not wade into manga territory. That's mostly because Fire Force is currently experiencing the same thing as MHA. While in the anime, the events of Fire Force seem relatively tame with some outrageously cool moments, the manga is completely bonkers. And while obviously in both MHA and Fire Force's case, we'll get there one day, at the current moment, we're just not there. So I'm gonna try, but some spoilers are just unavoidable, so we'll have warnings up when there's about to be spoilers. But now that we got all that out of the way, let's get to ranking and explaining Special Fire Company number eight. But before we get to ranking or explaining anything, guys, please, for me, like this video, subscribe to the page, and hit that noti bell. So Fire Force as a universe is fantastical and it goes off the rails very quickly, but that's nothing new for Atasushi Okubo. The same exact thing happened in Soul Eater. A relatively normal anime story chugs along for a couple hundred chapters, and then in the last 100 chapters, we just start cutting planets in half. And obviously, since today we're gonna be talking about the main character's company here, a lot of the people around the main character are also subject to these massive power-ups. But not every single character in Company 8 is broken. While every single member of Company 8 has their own role to play, not all of them are combatants. And while a good amount of them are combatants, obviously those combatants come in different tiers of strength. And within the confines of Company 8, those different tiers are planets away from each other. But obviously, since we're Talking about the entirety of Company 8, the weakest people are going to be the non-combatants, of which Company 8 has pseudo three. I say that because every single non-combatant in Company 8 also plays a role in combat, so calling them just straight up non-combatants is a bit of a lie. But coming in at number eight is the weakest of our non-combatants, Victor Leet. See, Leet is a genius scientist, the former head of incendiary research at Hajime Industries and current scientist for Company 8. Leet's contributions to the battle of Company 8 come in scientific observations or creations. See, Leet went to the Imperial University in Tokyo Tokyo, where he wrote a doctoral thesis about spontaneous human combustion and graduated from college in record time and at the top of his class. Because he was so intelligent and because he was so interested in spontaneous human combustions, Hajima Industries picked him up. Now, Hajima Industries picked up Leaked in order to control what he could figure out. You see, Hajima Industries wanted to slow the roll of this genius to make sure that he didn't uncover the secrets of the world that make Hajima Industries look not so great. However, this didn't stop Leaked. And in fact, while he was working at Hajima, he was able to lock himself away doing his research on spontaneous human combustion, growing ever closer by the year to the real answer behind why humans spontaneously combust. Because his research was getting closer and closer than anybody else had ever gotten to the answer, Joker actually made a contact with Victor in order to find out what was truly going on on the Earth. A partnership between two people trying to uncover why humans spontaneously combust and the secret behind Infernals. And then obviously, as time progressed, that relationship with Joker brought him to Special Company 8. A company created specifically to monitor and observe other companies and also answer scientific questions regarding infernals and spontaneous human combustion. See, Leaked himself has no combustion ability. He's not Gen 2, Gen 3, or Gen 4. Really, his only claim to fame in terms of abilities is his genius. See, Leaked understands the chemistry of infernals so well between his time at Hajima and his studies in college that not only is he able to perfectly analyze what an infernal may do, he's also able to infer what their abilities are without ever actually seeing said infernals. This also applies to second or third generation pyrokinetics that he may or may not know. 
know. So leaks with very limited information is able to deduce the abilities and limitations of abilities of people like members of the White Cloaks. And it's this intelligence and deductive ability that allows leaks to give company number eight a leg up on the White Class. He's also been shown to have an incredibly high battle IQ and planning prowess because he's been shown to help people like Joker, members of company eight in battle or to get out of battle. But since his only claim to fame in terms of power is his intelligence, unfortunately, he's last on our list. Coming in at number seven is another pseudo non-combatant whose real abilities don't shine on the battlefield, but in the things that he builds for others on the battlefield. There's only one person I could be talking about. Coming in at number seven is Vulcan. Vulcan, also known as the God of Fire and Smithing, is another non-combatant in Company 8. But Vulcan isn't really a non-combatant. While Vulcan himself has no ignition ability and the majority of his helpfulness in battle comes from his smithing ability, Vulcan falls into the same camp as Captain Obi. He's so strong, he can quite literally just bare hand knuckle box some flames every once in a while. While he doesn't do this nearly on the same level as Captain Obi, because because that's Captain Obi's entire brand. If it does come down to it, Vulcan can hold his own on the battlefield a little bit. See, Vulcan's true strength comes from his love and passion for engineering. And because Vulcan is an engineer, he's responsible for the creation and maintenance of all of Company 8's equipment. And the best example of the creation and maintenance of this equipment is Maki's Iron Owls. See, Maki uses a second generation pyrokinetic ability where she creates two sentient fireballs named Sputter and Flare. And while just alone, this technique was relatively strong, as she was able to direct these flames to go do something, and since they were sentient, they would go do it, Vulcan created the Iron Owls, which is essentially an iron body for both Sputter and Flare to inhabit. Upon encasing these Iron Owls, Maki was then able to essentially control giant flame-powered iron gauntlets. And Maki could use these giant flame-powered iron gauntlets to dole out damage to enemies, or simply extend the range of her second-generation pyrokinetic abilities. On top of that, we've seen that Vulcan has made a myriad of new additions to the matchbox in order to make sure that those in Company 8 who cannot fly, like Shinra, get to things like Demon Infernals and Massive Fire significantly earlier. However, since Vulcan is an incredible engineer who makes a bunch of Fire Force fighter equipment, he also has equipment for himself to put himself on the battlefield. And while he's not nearly as strong as Captain Obi when it comes to being an unpowered using equipment to fight against infernals and fires. This does still make him significantly stronger than Leet. But unfortunately, it does not make him stronger than our first pyrokinetic on this list, Tamaki. Listen, if we were ranking characters' abilities to act as fan service for the show, Tamaki would be by far and away number one. But unfortunately, the lucky loot ability isn't playing into Tamaki's power, which is fair to middling for a third generation. Like I said, Tamaki is a third generation, which means that she can create and maintain and control her own fire. And while the majority of third generations we've seen within the confines of Fire Force are incredibly powerful, Tamaki, even though she was once part of the incredibly prestigious and powerful Company One, is not one of them. See, Tamaki had dealings with Rekka. Rika? Rekka? I honestly don't remember. Regardless, she had dealings with them and therefore she was kind of banished from company one. Because of this, she ended up in company number eight. But instead of using her ignition ability to create and manipulate flames in the way that a lot of people would, that being something like Shinra shooting flames out of his feet or, you know, making your hands into flamethrowers, Tamaki uses her third generation pyrokinetic ability to boost her physical power. See, Tamaki has an ability called Nekomata, an ability that covers her in pink flames and gives her cat-like abilities, stubbing her with ears, a tail, claws, the whole nine yards. Now, with Nekomata activated, Tamaki is significantly faster and more agile. And since she's a third generation pyrokinetic, she can also create fireballs in her hands that look a lot like Rasengan's and use her enhanced agility and speed in order to deliver these fireballs to somebody's chest. Now, in the majority of the battles we see Tamaki enter into, this agility and speed and fireballs aren't enough, as Tamaki always finds herself being saved by Shinra or really anybody else. Because Tamaki kept finding herself in situations where she was losing, she wanted to become more powerful. And thus, when Shinra and Arthur were training with Benny Maru in Company 7, Tamaki was actually tasked to train with Hinata and Hikage, a set of young twins in Company 7 with blitzing speed. After playing the world's most intense game of tag for a couple of days, Tamaki's speed became such that, that now she is able to keep up with Shinra. Now, obviously, I'm not talking about Shinra when he uses his Adola Burst and quite literally moves at the speed of light. Obviously, I'm just talking about standard Shinra, but still keeping up with standard Shinra while he's flying using the fire propulsion system out of his feet, 
is a feat. But genuinely, speed and agility aren't even Tamaki's true claim to fame. See, as a third generation pyrokinetic, Tamaki is gonna have a small amount of fire resistance. But even amongst third generation pyrokinetics, Tamaki's flame resistance is next level. As Tamaki's durability is shown to be so high that she's able to sustain blows from assault and Orochi. With Orochi being a third generation pyrokinetic and one of the stronger members of the Knights of the Purple Smoke, and Assault also being a third generation and one of the strongest members of the White Clan. But listen, speed and durability are fine. It's great even to have those things. Without the offensive ability to knock out that opponent, you're just gonna be taking a lot of hits. And that's why in good consciousness, I couldn't put Tamaki above arguably my favorite member of the entirety of Company 8 and maybe my favorite character in the entire show, Captain Obi. You see, Captain Obi is unpowered. He has no ignition ability. However, prior to joining the Special Fire Force, he was such an incredible regular firefighter that he was chosen to be a captain of a new squadron. In fact, he was such an incredible firefighter prior to joining the Special Firefighting Force that twice because of the actions he did while a firefighter, he was given honorary medals in recognition. However, unfortunately, Obi was somewhat disgraced from the firefighting corps as he once defied orders to save somebody's life, which caused the medals and honors he had been given to be stripped away. But it speaks very much to his character. See, while Obi has what's referred to as hysterical strength, his truest strength is morale. The ability to rally people to his cause, to make those around him who may be actually better suited for fighting the battles that he's in, fight to their maximum output. But yeah, he's also hysterically strong. Since Captain Obi understands that in his job, he has to fight Infernals and that he has no combustion ability, he trains every minute of every day, making him superhumanly strong. It is far beyond the realm of what any human could accomplish. At any given point when heading into a battle with an Infernal, Obi is carrying about 30 kilograms of gear. For those of you who don't know kilograms, that's about 70-ish pounds. And this is things like fire extinguishers and axes, or the core annihilating pile bunker, which is essentially just a jackhammer, but held horizontal, put into an Infernal's core and released. But how is Captain Obi able to get close enough to these Infernals to use this Equipment. Well, it's because he's strong enough to rip train tracks out of the ground and bend steel with his bare hands. On top of that, while Captain Obi has quite literally no fire resistance whatsoever, he doesn't really mind getting burned. We've seen Captain Obi with his bare hands grabbing Infernals. Now, mind you, an Infernal is constantly on fire. So while Captain Obi may have no resistance to fire, he has an incredibly high pain tolerance. I mean, this unpowered man took multiple explosive hits from Benny Maru and not only survived, but closed the distance between him and Benny Maru to land a hit. Captain Obi's strength being referred to as hysterical brings up a couple of questions around why he's so strong. See, hysterical strength is actually a third generation pyrokinetic ability. It's very similar to Tamaki's ability to make herself faster and more agile, except apply that to strength, not speed and agility. Benny Maru believes that Obi might have this ability as he's able to rip through chain link fences with his bare fingers and make his muscles so hard that insect stingers cannot break into his skin. Not to mention Captain Obi was once captured with metal chains and he quite literally just flexed his way out of them. Captain Obi, just like Mike Guy or Rock Lee or Asta, is the perfect example of being born into a world without an ability that makes you strong and working your way to the top anyways. While when it really comes down to it against the strongest of strong opponents, Captain Obi's probably not going to do much. His insane strength, dedication to keeping his company alive, and willingness to put his life on the line put him pretty high on this list, but not so high as his lieutenant. See, well, Captain Obi's entire trick is to get himself as close enough as possible with his hysterical strength and his high pain tolerance in order to pierce an Infernal's core. His lieutenant, Lieutenant Hinawa, doesn't have to worry about all that. See, just like with Captain Obi, Lieutenant Hinawa didn't start in the Fire Force. In fact, Hinawa was a sergeant in the Armed Forces, where he was actually Maki's direct supervisor. However, when Hinawa's friend Tojo infernalizes and asks Hinawa to kill him, Hinawa can't. And before Hinawa can either kill or be killed by Tojo, a bunch of soldiers storm into their room and kill Tojo. Shook by the entire experience, Hinawa heads into town with his best friend's gun. And while walking through town, he stumbles upon Captain Obi, still part of the regular fire force, trying to deal with Infernals. Obi asks for help in battling these Infernals, and Hinawa steps in. Upon talking, it's revealed that Obi is fed up with the way that the fire force treats Infernals with no respect 
for their living family members. Hinawa has come to realize that he could have done more for Tojo and therefore should be helping in the battle against Infernals to make up for it. And thus, Lieutenant Hinawa became the first member of Company 8. You see, Hinawa is a second generation pyrokinetic. And as a second generation pyrokinetic, he cannot create his own flames. And thus, he channels his pyrokinetic abilities through the medium of guns and this could be any kind of gun a submachine gun a pistol a rifle a shotgun anything as long as there's black powder in the shell casing that creates an explosion that fires a pellet or a bullet he can control that flame and the way that hinawa uses this ability is essentially he can either make the flame that's firing a bullet or a shotgun shell stronger or weaker. Hinawa can make the explosion of the propellant so small that a bullet fired from a pistol is no longer lethal. Or he can increase the explosion of the propellant to such a degree that it increases the penetrative power of a bullet he's firing. We've seen Hinawa able to increase the explosive potential of the propellant on a bullet to such a degree that it exploded the barrel of the gun he was shooting. However, by doing this, he's able to make a regular rifle bullet, essentially an armor-piercing 50 cal. But Hinawa's abilities don't end there. Hinawa actually has two other abilities trajectory control and ricochet control. See, Hinawa, upon firing a bullet, can control its trajectory. Meaning, let's say hypothetically, he didn't have an angle to shoot somebody, he could fire the bullet, bend the bullet, and hit them. However, since Hinawa does essentially have control over his bullet in the air, he can also increase how far that bullet will go, using the heat of the bullet to create more kinetic energy to increase its range. His other ability, ricochet control, allows Hinawa to control where and how a bullet will ricochet. Because when a bullet hits a surface, it creates sparks. Hinawa can use these sparks to actually increase a bullet's velocity upon ricochet, meaning that if you're basically anywhere within a mile of Hinawa, he can probably hit you with a bullet. Now, here's the thing about all of this. Now, if his ability was just the ability to control or decrease the explosive capabilities of the propellant shooting the bullet forward, that would be one thing. But being able to control the trajectory and ricochet of a bullet implies that Hinawa is able to respond and control the sparks generated from a bullet hitting a wall. Mind you, that happens within tenths of tenths of tenths of a second. Hinawa is not only able to plan the trajectory of a bullet and also possible ricochets, he's able to act on that plan, meaning he is in live time reacting to a bullet in travel, which, mind you, go thousands of meters per second. So while yes, obviously Hinawa doesn't have the ability to bend steel and rip chains like they're made of paper, the fact that he can ghost anybody within a square mile of him, regardless where they are, is pretty powerful. But that's only a second generation pyrokinetic ability. That's got to be weaker than a fourth generation pyrokinetic ability, surely. By the way, we're now entering spoiler territories. So if you don't want spoilers from the manga, I would skip to entry number three, whose time starts at, it's currently on the screen. I have God knows idea. That's Cody's job. Is everyone gone that doesn't want spoilers? All right, cool, moving forward. So as we all know, one of the most important things in Fire Force is finding the eight pillars. These eight pillars are individual representations of all of the shortcomings of humans. Things like madness, passivity, apathy, and despair. See, while well, those of you who watch the anime know that Shinra is the fourth pillar, because Shinra has an Adola burst, and the pillars are those who have awoken to Adola bursts. Well, it's actually not always the case. Some people who have Adola bursts actually aren't pillars, but we won't get into that right now. But Shinra actually isn't the only pillar on Company 8. See, because while Shinra is the fourth pillar, Iris is the eighth, the pillar of despair. See, while the majority of the list you'll read about the strongest members in Company 8 will put Iris at the bottom, that's because they haven't finished the manga. See, if we're just talking about Iris within the confines of the anime, she is just a member of the Holy Soul Temple. She's well practiced in prayers and therefore is capable of putting Infernals to rest. On top of that, we've seen the fact that she has a small amount of medical knowledge, but it's revealed towards the end of the manga after Shinra wins in a very important fight that Iris has become the eighth pillar. And upon the stone pillars emerging, signifying that all eight pillars had been found by the evangelist, meaning that the Adola and the living worlds were getting closer, Iris found that she was awakening to a third generation pyrokinetic ability. However, what that ability was, wasn't entirely clear. All that we knew at the moment was that Iris was creating embers from her fingertips. However, Iris speculates that this isn't the first time that she's ever done this, implying that she's most likely had this pyrokinetic ability since she was a child, since she was one of the only people to survive the orphanage fire. But as Fire Force comes into its true final battle, Iris plays an immeasurable and incredibly powerful role. See, Iris has an ability 
ability very similar to Panko Pats, a former captain of Company 4. See, Panko Pat is a third generation pyrokinetic who has an ability called buff stacking, where by blowing his whistle, he's able to increase either his or somebody else's resistance to flames. He can even use this ability to buff the abilities of other pyrokinetics, earning him the title Master Firefighter of Buffs. And these buffs can be stacked to make either him or other fighters superhumanly strong. Iris has an ability similar to this, but even stronger. See, while Iris's pyrokinetic abilities are far, far, far from fully explored, what we saw is that she was able to cloak herself and her allies in a completely flame-resistant cloaking. She wasn't buffing their fire resistance, she was making them immune to fire. With this cloaking, Iris was able to protect Company 8 from flame attacks from arguably the second strongest person in the entire show and the blowback shockwaves of Shinra using light speed kicks. While we understand that this is a third generation pyrokinetic ability, it's also loosely implied that it's tied to the Adola realm, therefore making it an Adola burst, which would make sense because once again, Iris is the eighth pillar. So while yes, in combat ability, Iris is by far and away the weakest, but when we talk about the fact that she can basically negate the attacks from the strongest people in her universe, it's hard to not put her at least at number four. But because she has a complete lack of offensive ability, unfortunately, I have to put her lower than a second generation pyrokinetic. That's right, coming in at number three, we have the Gorilla Maki. By the way, if you skipped the spoilers, welcome back. Maki, outside of being an awakening for a lot of people watching Fire Force, is also one of the strongest people in the universe, which is saying a lot when you consider the fact that of the top four, she is the only non-third generation or higher. Maki is the daughter of an important general in the armed forces and previously worked directly under Lieutenant Hinawa. However, after Hinawa was recruited into the brand new company number eight, Maki was the second ever member. See, out of everybody's abilities in Fire Force, I would argue that Maki's is my favorite. And that's not just because she is currently my background and also was an awakening for me for realizing that, oh, women with muscles. When it comes to hand-to-hand -to -hand combat, Maki is arguably the second strongest member of Company 8 behind Captain Obi. As a former soldier in the Tokyo military, when it comes to putting up the Dukes, she's as good as anybody. This is evidenced by the fact that when she was fighting against Arthur, a third generation pyrokinetic who can wield a plasma sword, she was very easily able to disarm him. On top of the fact that not only was she able to dodge attacks from Benny Maru, she was also able to adjust in counterattack against Benny Maru, who was hailed as the strongest fire soldier. Not to mention, she was basically solely responsible for teaching Shinra how to do hand to hand. But outside of being freakishly strong, incredibly attractive, and incredibly well versed in hand to hand combat, Maki is arguably the strongest second generation user we know. Unless you consider Benny Maru a second generation user, but he exists somewhere in the weird in between, between second and third generation. Generation. As far as pure second generation pyrokinetics go, Maki is the strongest. Except for maybe Kron. He did basically destroy the moon. It's a close fight, okay? See, Maki's pyrokinetic prowess is so incredible that she's often referred to as a witch. This is because out of all of the second generations we've seen throughout Fire Force, Maki probably has the widest control, meaning that Maki can control flames that are thousands of meters away from her. In fact, it's been stated that she can control flames in the upper atmosphere, which is 53 to 375 miles away from the Earth. So at the very least, 53 miles away is how far she can control her flames from. Because of this, when it comes to fighting against third generations, there's arguably nobody better than Maki. Because third generations rely on creating their own flame and using it in combat, second generations who have an incredibly wide control of all of the flames around them can control and extinguish or amplify those third generations flames. Because of this, we've often seen Maki in combat against multiple third generations at once and been completely fine. Because let's say hypothetically, Hypothetically, you want to throw a fireball at me. If you're within 53 miles of me, I can just extinguish it. And because of this, Maki is usually on protection detail for the rest of Company 8, redirecting or completely extinguishing flames heading towards Company 8. And the scope of the flames that Maki can control and extinguish really isn't limited. It's just about how much time she has to prepare. Maki may not be able to redirect or extinguish a small little fireball if she's caught by surprise. However, if Maki is able to dig her feet in and get prepared, there's almost no level of flame she can't redirect. Maki was able to redirect an explosion that would have destabilized the entirety of the foundation of Tokyo and made it sink into the ground 
when she had enough time. Meaning, essentially, Maki was able to control an explosion that would have leveled the entirety of Tokyo. And she only gets stronger than this. Towards the end of the manga, when Adola encroaches on the physical world and pyrokinetic abilities get stronger because of how Adola and pyrokinetic abilities are linked, Maki is able to briefly hold back an explosion larger than the one that would have leveled Tokyo. Mind you, Tokyo in the real world is 847 square miles. And Maki was able to hold back not one, but two explosions that would have leveled the entirety of it. And that's if you're just assuming this is the Tokyo in the real world, which it probably isn't considering it's now referred to as the Tokyo Empire and the rest of humanity's surviving population had to move to Tokyo. Mind you, the strongest nuclear device known to man, the Zarbamba. Mind you, the Zarbamba, the biggest bomb known to man, has a destructive radius of 35 kilometers. But the fireball itself only extends for about three and a half kilometers in all directions which is only about 40 square kilometers, not miles. So we are talking multiple nuclear bombs worth of explosions that Maki is capable of redirecting. But redirecting and suppressing flame isn't the only thing that Maki does with her second generation pyrokinetic ability. She also, like we talked about earlier, has iron owls, which with the combination of her two sentient flames, sputter and flare, is able to control at massive distances because once again, she has an insane radius of control. And with the combination of these iron owls, she's able to do things like act as a scout because there's a camera on them or use them to fly into opponents at high speeds, or even create a shield for herself since they're made of metal. But unfortunately, even with the ability to control the flames of multiple nuclear blasts and direct them 53 miles away from her body, Maki is not as powerful as our second entry on this list, Arthur. Yes, the delusional night boy who gets stronger the further he gets into his cosplay is arguably one of the strongest beings in the Fire Force universe. Arthur is supposed to act as a foil for the child genius trope in every single shonen anime. The child who just seems to get good at everything because they're good at everything. Arthur's strength doesn't lie in his genius, it actually lies in his idiocy. And this is all derived from the fact that Arthur's parents, before abandoning him, said that he was the king of the castle and that they're going on an adventure to save the world. Because it's the last thing that Arthur's parents ever told to him, he dubbed himself a king. And the more that he believes that he is the actual King Arthur, the stronger he gets. But this scales to like a hilariously high level. I mean, we've seen simple things like Arthur repelling infernals with a punch. But once again, as we get towards the end of the manga, Arthur's powers get kind of out of hand. I have to wade slightly into spoiler territory here, but I'm gonna be talking about it in the most spoiler-free way possible. Essentially, all you need to know is that towards the end of the Fire Force manga, there is a man by the name of Dragon. Dragon is the leader of the White Clad Destroyers. You know, the team Assault is part of. Dragon has existed for hundreds of years. He is arguably the second or third strongest pyrokinetic user on Earth. But his name is Dragon. And while absolutely there's a these nuts joke in there, Arthur doesn't think about that. Arthur thinks, oh, this man's name is Dragon. I'm slaying a dragon like King Arthur and takes an incredible leap forward in strength. So much so that the first time that Arthur and Dragon meet on the battlefield, Arthur actually contends with Dragon for a good amount of time. However, Arthur loses. And Arthur loses a couple of times, getting stronger every single time. And Dragon allows him to keep getting stronger because Dragon is intrigued by him. And eventually Dragon actually recognizes Arthur as the only person who's ever made Dragon bleed. And eventually as Arthur's strength keeps building and building and building, he not only begins to match Dragon's flame output, but he also begins to match his speed. In strength. And I'm not gonna tell you how their final battle goes because that's too deep into spoiler territory. But let's just say that during this final battle, Arthur uses his strongest technique. And what does that strongest technique do? It cuts the earth in half. Just in twain, right down the middle like a good wedgie. And this attack was so powerful that it destroyed some of the flames of the Great Cataclysm, which have been burning for hundreds of years. Mind you, the flames of the Great Cataclysm were summoned directly from the Adola. So by being able to put these flames out, somehow Arthur has willed himself by not being one of the pillars into putting out Adola flames. But strength isn't the only thing that Arthur has. He's also got speed. How much speed, you ask? Well, one, 
reacted to Shin Zadola burst. You know, the one that completely cools off the entire universe and essentially stops time for everybody but Shin. He's fast enough to react to that, which Shinra was only able to react to because he was able to break his body into light particles. Arthur is also able to travel fast enough to go through the vacuum of space without worrying about running out of oxygen, being able to travel from the Earth to the Sun with little to no problems. When Arthur is fully living in his own delusion, he's quite literally Dragon Ball level. He can move at light speed and he can destroy planets. Now are the shockwaves of his battle destroying entire universes? No, but like he's early DBZ level and that's saying something. But unfortunately, Arthur isn't the main character of this show. No, that prestigious honor remains to be Shinra's, who is somehow stronger than the man who can basically also travel at the speed of light and cut planets in half. See Shinra, just like Arthur, is a third generation pyrokinetic. I don't even think I talked about Arthur's pyrokinetic ability. Plasma Sword, okay, we get it. He actually has more than Plasma Sword. He has an ability called Ring Link and like plasmets or plasmatites that allows him to travel even faster. But you now understand the scale of what Arthur can accomplish. You don't need to know the names. Back to Shinra. Third generation pyrokinetic, technically fourth generation pyrokinetic because Shinra is the fourth pillar, meaning that he has access to an Adola Burst. However, since Shinra doesn't have an Adola Grace, he can't really use his Adola Burst as often as he would like to, in the anime at least. But for the moment, let's talk about his third generation pyrokinetic ability. See, when Shinra was incredibly young, he gained the ability to create and control flames from his feet. With a lot of training, Shinra figured out how to control these flames from his feet and use them to increase his speed and kicking ability and punching ability and all of that. On, on top of being able to create and control flames from his feet, as a third generation pyrokinetic, Shinra also has an immense amount of durability towards flame, being able to take blows from the likes of Benny Maru and k -Ron, and other people with even higher fire output than those two, but that happens in the manga, so we won't touch on it right now. Just with the use of this third generation pyrokinetic ability, Shinra has shown to be able to generate enough force to kick off limbs or destroy infernal cores. But genuinely, the true strength of his third generation pyrokinetic ability is his speed. See, Shinra is the fastest person in Fire Force. With just the ability of his third generation pyrokinetic abilities, he is faster than a jet plane, being able to break the sound barrier. And that was before he unlocked his rapid, something that Shinra was able to accomplish after training with Benny Maru. And after achieving this rapid, Shinra was able to travel at 10 times his original speed. And considering the fact that his original speed could break the sound barrier, we're talking at least Mach 10, which means at the very least, it is 7,000 miles an hour. With this speed boost, we've seen Shinra be able to react to things like lasers. Like when you react to Nataku's laser barrage. Mind you, a laser is light. It travels at the speed of light, meaning that Shinra is able to react to speed of light attacks. But since Shinra is also the pillar of rage, he can get faster the angrier he gets. In fact, we once saw Shinra in a battle against somebody very powerful get so mad that he almost reached light speed without the use of his Adola Burst. On top of that, you know how we talked about hysterical strength when we were talking about Captain Obi? Well, while it's hypothesized that Captain Obi might have access to it, we know that Shinra does. And by using this hysterical strength, Shinra has 100% access to his ignition ability, his third generation pyrokinetic ability. While without using it, he usually only has 30%. While in this form, Shinra's flames are no longer red, they're blue, implying that they're burning at a significantly higher temperature. And this hysterical strength very much plays into the end of the manga. Like when, oh, I don't know, Shinra kicks the moon back into orbit. You heard that right. It's said that this kick delivered an impact of 10 trillion megatons. To go back to the Tsar Bomba for a little bit of reference here, it's 50 megatons. Shinra's kick to the moon to kick it back into gravitational orbit was 10 trillion. And he did it without going light speed, meaning he did it without the use of his Adola Burst. Because while he's using his Adola Burst and he's traveling at light speed, since he is a mass, not a wave traveling at light speed, he has infinite force generation. But you wanna know the fun thing about Shinra's Adola Link and Adola Burst is that he doesn't travel at the speed of light. He travels faster than the speed of light, which is impossible, mind you. Nothing can travel faster than the speed of light, except for 
of course Shinra. Because Shinra moves so fast, his body has to break into subatomic particles, but because those subatomic particles are moving faster than the speed of light, they hop into a different dimension and go backwards to when Shinra was actually not a bunch of subatomic particles. Oh, but you thought it ended there? You silly, silly child. This is gonna be spoiler territory, so if you don't wanna hear about Shinra's final evolution, then I'd recommend just skipping to the end of the video, leaving a like, leaving a nice comment, and I'll see you on the next one. If you do wanna hear about Shinra, Shinra's final evolution though, well, I'd love to tell you about it. So Shinra by the end of the manga achieves a new form known as Shinra Benchoman, where Shinra resonates his soul with the soul of both his brother and his mother and achieves a new form of quite literally godlike power. What do I mean when I say godlike power? I mean he is god. He has been referred to as god. What he accomplishes is godlike. He's god. When he manifested this form, he gained control over all all of creation. And after defeating the evangelist kind of easily, he revived the entire human race, recreated the earth, and recreated the entire universe in his own image. And that's actually how we got the Soul Eater world. Yep, that's right. We got Soul Eater because Shinra fused with his mother and his brother, became God, and created the universe. In this form, simply by walking, Shinra makes continent-sized explosions. In this form, he can manifest whatever he wants out of nothing. He created a whale out of midair simply because he saw one at Vulcan's workshop. He can also warp reality. Basically, anything that he wants to change, he can. He turned a beam of light into a city. Not to mention, he can also control time, being able to flow it backwards, forwards, quickly, slowly. Do whatever he wants with it, really. And he has the power of gaslighting. I shit you not, Shinra is able to turn despair into hope and hope into despair. He has control over non-tangible ideas. In this form, he is arguably the strongest anime character ever. If he is not God, he could kill her. And that's <laughs> all Company 8, right? It explained. You know, it's just a silly little story about people who can control fire. You know, that's that's really all it is when it boils down to it. Definitely doesn't divulge into this crazy power scaling situation where a couple of them become like god level eaters of suns. If you guys enjoyed the synopsis of Company 8, tell me in the comments below. And while you guys are down there, please, for me, like this video, subscribe to the page, and go hit that noti bell. Listen, just go read the manga, all right? The anime's taken forever. Who knows when it'll finish? That and One Punch Man. Just give up. Just go read.